might hear some thunder. And we might actually lose power if we get a lightning hit. So if that happens, just log back in. Okay. Um, We had a tornado warning, that's right. Here, watch. Yep, we sure did. Again, Again, cool They're relaunching the Apollo 11 right now. Happens every time somebody calls me. That storm that just went past this looks like it may be producing a tornado up in Missouri. Missouri's had some nasty tornadoes. It's got some. I got a cool app on my phone called a. Uh, Run for your life. Well, might as well be called radar scope. It shows rotation. Yeah, I have radar scope too. It's a uh, great app. Well, actually, there's. It's anti cyclonic activity right now that's just out right over us. Mm -hmm. It's rotating clockwise, not counterclockwise. Pouring outside right now. It sounds like it. Well, hello everybody. This is Scott Roberts, Kent Martz, and our special guest, Chuck Allen here for the Vice President from the Astronomical League. We're here for another episode of, uh, of uh, First Light Chronicles. And uh, so it's, um, it's our pleasure to come back and to talk more. This is really kind of an Astronomical League thing where Kent is uh, covering the uh, Universe Sampler program. Uh, we got we have an official from the Astronomical League here, and uh, uh, Chuck, you're, I think that you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the League's um, awards program. Yes, I do. Thank you, Scott. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the Astronomical League is 75 years old this year, and I have an announcement to make today to people who may be listening who are or are not members of the Astronomical League. And for that, I'd like to go to screen share, if I may. Sure. <clears throat> okay, let's get... Okay. For those who are not familiar with the League, it's uh, an organization, a federation of astronomy societies across the United States and really throughout many other countries. We have over 18,000 members in 304 different societies. And <clears throat> right now, we are in the middle of our award season, and this is something that may be of interest to young people, especially whether or not, again, you happen to be league members. Our youth awards are rather robust with the great help of people like Scott Roberts and uh, Explore Scientific. 
who have sponsored some of our major awards over many, many years. Uh, none more significantly than the National Young Astronomer Award. Uh, Scott and Explore Scientific have sponsored this award for the better part of its 30 year history. Uh, the winner of this uh, award, which is aimed at research done by young people of high school age, uh, is an expense paid trip to our national convention to receive the award and plaque and a, qual a high quality telescope from Explore Scientific donated by Scott's company. To be eligible, you need to be either a US citizen or enrolled in a US secondary school uh, and be between 14 and 19 years of age at the time of nomination or application and not enrolled in college. This does not mean that you can't be enrolled in a few courses while you're in high school. Uh, just contact us if there's any issue there. Uh, this award looks mighty good on a college application. So you might wanna give some consideration to it if you're doing research. Karen Lee is our winner from last year. Uh, her project on identification of an unknown source of 21 centimeter neutral hydrogen emission was absolutely incredible. She yeah. built her own radio telescope and determined uh, through incredible scientific method, the source of a previously unknown uh, 21 centimeter emission source in the sky. Really incredible. Uh, Andrew Hitchner, uh, 10 years or 11 years ago, uh, won the award for a study in stellar spectroscopy. And I picked this because they're Scott, uh, our major sponsor of this award for so many years for which we're grateful and uh, beyond words. Uh, here are some of the other projects that we had last year. Uh, Leon Garcia studied uh, the nuclei of ring galaxies. Uh, Roth Murad uh, identified signatures of cosmic strings uh, in simulations through Lyman Alpha Forest Spectra. Vivek Vijay Kumar uh, has won the National Young Astronomer Award and come in second in the award in two different years. He did a project last year characterizing the pulsation of Delta Scuti stars using magnesium 1B triplet. Emily Zhao uh, did a research project on an automated search for globular clusters in the Virgo cluster of dwarf galaxies. Uh, again, this award is open to people who are in high school in the United States or US citizens, regardless of league membership. So if you're doing any kind of research on astronomy and you're in high school, consider this award, please. We also have a number of youth service awards that are supported by the Horkheimer Charitable Fund. Uh, we have two major service awards. These awards are for young people who support local astronomy societies or engage in public education and astronomy, uh, public outreach of various kinds. And these come with large cash prizes of $1,750 and $1,000. Uh, the convention trips that go to our top two NIA winners and our uh, Horkheimer Smith Service Award winner uh, can be fantastic experiences. Our, our award winners in 2019 uh, got to go on a cruise to the Bahamas. Uh, so give it a shot if you're interested in doing research or if you're engaged in service. We also have a Horkheimer Parker Youth Imaging Award. If you're a young person, uh, doing imaging, uh, we have three cash prizes of $1,500 and $250. And if you're between eight and 14 years of age and are up for writing a 500 word essay on any scientific topic, even one not dealing with astronomy, we have a journalism award that also provides three cash prizes to its winners. To apply for these awards, go to www.astroleague.org. Uh, click on the awards uh, menu uh, link on the left, pick the award you're interested in, whether it's National Young Astronomer Award or one of the Jack Horkheimer Awards, and that will take you in this example to a list of the Horkheimer Awards. From there, you can go to, let's say, a specific service award and go straight to the application and fill it out and you're on your way. And it's pretty self-explanatory in some cases we have an instruction sheet along with the award as we do with our National Young Astronomer Award. If you are interested in being a member of the league and you have to be a member in order to apply for the service awards that I just mentioned and also for the Parker and uh, the, uh, the Omira, uh, excuse me, the Parker Imaging Award, joining the league is very easy. You can either join one of our 304 member societies 
or you can join as a league member at large. Uh, and that would be only $20 for youth under the age of 19. And you can join right online, again, www.astroleague.org. Joining the league gets you a lot of benefits. It gives you access to over 76 observing program awards that we have. Uh, we offer the most robust series of observing programs of any organization in the entire world. Uh, actually, we have over 80. They come with pins and certificates. We also have master progressions that result in the awards of master observer plaques to people. And that comes with national recognition in our quarterly magazine reflector, uh, along with specific programs that you complete along the way. And again, uh, we hold conventions all over the country. We've been in 28 different states so far, all with fantastic tours of local observatories and other scientific facilities. Obviously, this year and last year, we have not been able to have a convention due to COVID, but we're hoping to get that back on track with a convention in Albuquerque, New Mexico next year, uh, which will come with a trip to the VLA, among many other interesting uh, tours and locations. There are a lot of benefits to being a member of the league. So if you are interested in applying for one of the awards that does require league membership, uh, please consider it. Again, if you're a young person under 19, it's only $20 a year. For those in the Astronomical League, uh, we have also, of course, a full uh, panoply of awards available to all league members. Uh, one is the Astronomical League Award, seen uh, here being given to Richard Gott of Princeton University. Uh, we have the Peltier Award, uh, for which you can nominate someone who has exhibited incredible observing skills over the years. This is Jim Fox, a former league president who won the Peltier Award for his long-term uh, photometric research of the atmospheres of Uranus and Neptune. If your club has a great... Uh, Website, nominate your webmaster for the league's webmaster award. And if your club has an excellent newsletter, nominate the newsletter editor for the Mabel Stearns newsletter award. We also have a sketching award, which has cash prizes associated with it. If you're doing some interesting sketching of anything in space, uh, please submit an application for this award as well. We've had a new award this year. It's the Wilhelmina Fleming Imaging Award. This is open to female league members age 19 and over. Uh, we are no longer seeking a sponsor for this, but uh, we have not got uh, the tails worked out on prizes yet. Uh, the deadline for this is different from the deadline for the other awards because it's new and the deadline is May 31st. Explore Scientific, uh, Scott Roberts will also be sponsoring a new general imaging award for the Astronomical League and details of this are still being worked out. We hope to have that announcement on our website very soon. Also, it's time to apply for the Library Telescope Giveaway. The Astronomical League gives away 11 library telescopes for placement in libraries. We give uh, <clears throat> a library telescope to one club in each of our 10 regions and to one member at large uh, each year. And that application deadline is March 31st as it is for virtually all of our awards. So here's the summary. Uh, again, if you're a young person and you're engaged in research or you're between eight and 14 and engaged in writing and want to enter the journalism award competition, you do not need to be a league member. If you are applying for the service awards or the imaging awards, you do need to be a league member under the age of 19. Uh, for most of our uh, general awards, uh, the Astronomical League Award can go to anyone, uh, and the Webmaster and Mabel Stern's Newsletter Awards, Sketching Award, Fleming Award, and eventually the Explore Scientific Imaging Award will all go to league members. Uh, so nominate someone or apply. Uh, our all award deadlines, again, are just in two weeks, on March 31st, except for the Williamina Fleming Imaging Award, which is, I said a moment ago, is May 31st. And the Explore Scientific Imaging Award will also have a different deadline because we haven't announced the details yet. If you have any questions regarding any of these awards, please just write me. There's my email address. 
Uh, I'll get back to you immediately and answer any questions you have. And Scott, uh, again, thank you for all you do for the Astronomical League for giving me this opportunity to speak about these awards and also for your support of, uh, of our programs over all these years. We really appreciate it. It's been great, it's been rewarding and uh, you know, I love it. So it's awesome. And uh, it's the people that make the difference. You know, so Chuck, you are, uh, I think the league is so fortunate to have you as uh, uh, you know, engaged as long as you've been with the, the league. I, you've been with them for over 20 years, right? I first joined in 1960. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So, <laughs> so when I was one year old. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Scott. <laughs> so, Chuck, were you five that year? You're, you must have been like five. I was, tw I was 12. And you remember ever of the. Actually, I was 11 when I first joined. Yeah. Well, at least I wasn't an embryo. Okay. So I was. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, Chuck, thank you so much. Uh, you know, the league gives out so many uh, amazing awards and it, they really do make a difference. Um, uh, you know, you see where, you know, occasionally I hear where uh, National Young Astronomer Award uh, recipients have gone, you know, I mean, they, they go on to do great things. They become, uh, uh, you know, involved in some sort of science or technology field. Uh, they're brilliant uh, uh, people. And, uh, uh, you know, having, having being recognized like that at a young age makes a big impression on them and gives them fuel to do something for the rest of their lives. So, um, you know, I think it's awesome. Well, thanks. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Uh, Yep, and um, is there any uh, anything else that they should know before uh, before you sign off there? I don't think so. Uh, again, it's all on the website, which is finally updated. Our website's a bit under construction right now because we're transferring the whole site to a, a new WordPress platform. But all of the award information is current and all the application forms are current. Uh, right. If anyone out there looked at the application forms recently and saw it, <clears throat> like 2020 or 2018 on one of the forms, that's all been corrected. So uh, okay. the forms are there. Great, wonderful. All right, that's great. So Kent, uh, this is, uh, I guess, all the All Astronomical League uh, program today because you're doing the uh, Universe Sampler uh, program. Uh, I thought that I, I warned everybody that we had this uh, thunderstorm coming over and if you saw it on the radar is this little tiny thing you know we've had big storms come and hit us but I shot a little video out the window while it was passing through it, it was raining among the hardest I've ever seen it rain <laughs> look at this that's hail that's hail off of Robert's truck yeah luckily it was all pea-sized hail so it didn't do much damage but Mike Wiesner, you know, I said something on the, before we started about uh, radar scope, and he yeah. replied back, "Radar scope is great, and I will testify to and swear to the use of radar scope. It takes feed off of a what straight off a of weather radar, and it's live, so it's you know updates every minute or so. So uh, it's a uh, really good app to use. I subscribe to the first paid level. I suspect Wiesner has." the uh the high-end level but maybe not but it's a great app if you've got an iphone radar scope uh, is a great scope for or a great app for the united states so anyway especially if you live out here so yeah where you need to you know get tornadoes coming in and learn to use it there's pretty good technology there so yeah. all right so let's uh, uh let me share my screen here There we go. We should be up and running now. Is that correct? Did my screen share? No, not yet. There you go. There we go. Okay. So as we've been over, uh, this is lesson three, uh, star charts and constellation patterns. And again, this is the Astronomical League Universe Sampler class. And by going through the Universe Sampler class and a uh, uh, following the Companion Universe Sampler uh, Observing Club, you can win an observing award for 
uh, simply going through the Astronomical League's Universe Sampler class, uh, filling out the forms, doing some data retention, following the guidelines, and you can get yourself an award from the Astronomical League. I've been through this multiple times, and I have never uh, done that. I should do that because it's pretty straightforward. It's a great way to start. Uh, here's the cover of the, the Universe Sampler. Uh, Amelia Goldberg has done a great job with it. I don't know how long it's been around, a long time. Chuck, um, how long has it been around for? You're, you're muted. I'll, you I'll, I'll look that up and get right back to you. I'm just curious. It's been around for a while. I know that. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So I have uh, created a shortened link because finding it on the website is somewhat difficult. So there's the bit.ly link uh, that you can see. So write that down. I'll leave it up and I'll come back to this at the end of the program so you can be prepared to write it down it's 13 dollars it's a it's 13 dollars well spent and here is the uh, bit.ly link for the observing club as well um, a quick review lesson two how to find north in the sky uh, using guide stars and the big dipper asterism or in cassiopeia and big dipper is not a constellation it's an asterism Ca uh, big dipper is part of the constellation ursa major and it's called an asterism because it's a pattern within a, 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 a constellation. And when you're using a planisphere, remember they're designed to be used overhead. So west is east, west and east are reversed, they're on the wrong side. So you turn it around so north is at your belly and then hold it over your head and uh, that makes the planisphere work. So lesson three, star charts and constellation patterns. So. The sky is divided into 88 constellations, uh, and we can see a lot of them in the northern hemisphere. Um, but there's some down south that we can't see. I look forward to a journey south sometime so I can see the southern constellations. Um, many new observers find it difficult to pick out the star patterns and remember where to find them. And that comes simply with time and looking at the stars. The thing is, with most people now living where there's a lot of light pollution, Finding the constellations, frankly, is easier as long as it's a bright constellation like Orion, uh, you know, some uh, big bright stars, because the light pollution eliminates all the other stars, so you can't see them. So all you can see typically are the brightest stars. Now, if I have a customer who lives in New York City, um, he says on any given night, if he stays up all night, he could probably see 10 or 12 stars maybe 14 if there were some planets involved. So uh, some light pollution weirdly makes it easier. The first time I went to the Nebraska star party, the first time since I've been an adult, that I've been in a, a really dark sky. This had been back in around, oh, 2003 or four. Uh, it got dark mm -hmm. and I could not find the constellations because there were so many stars in the sky. And I, it was really a disconcerting feeling and the first night, I literally sat there in a, in a chair looking up at the sky, just drinking it all in and getting oriented and trying to find the constellations because it was difficult. And I'm sure Chuck has experienced that as well. Uh, and I know Scott has. We've talked about it. Um, so, By the way, Canada Ken, of 1997 is when this program started. 1997. Okay. You know, and, and you know, that points out if there's somebody interested in starting another observing club and administering it then uh, most assuredly the Astronomical League will entertain that and facilitate it, I'm sure. And what was the one we thought about last week, Scott? I meant to write it down and didn't. Do you it's remember a, what it was? The What was the observing club that, that I thought of last week? I don't know. Uh, I meant to write it down and I did and got busy. If one of the people watching uh, remembers what it was, I know some of you were on please put it in text so we can write, because it was a, a legitimately good idea for another observing club. All right, so moving on. When you try to learn the constellations, it's just a matter of going out and picking them out in the sky. And once you can find them, and we'll show some pictures of where they are, you know, this suggests taking four or five or six constellations and trying to come up with a mind story uh, of your own, uh, something that help, can help you remember the association of what's close by. So this example uh, takes Orion, Canis Major, Canis Minor, Lepus, Monoceros, and Taurus into one group. And it creates this story. 
and I'm not going to read it, but it has this story about, you know, everything going on with the dogs and chasing the rabbit. Lepus is, is, is the rabbit. Um, Monoceros, if you think about it, mono meaning one, seros probably meaning horse. It's going to be a unicorn and turns out that's what it is. Um, so there's a good way to, to figure that out. So, you know, you're looking at a planisphere, or, which is, this is a sky chart, much like a planisphere. And, you know, it's a jumble of constellations. But if you start studying it, you can find out that Orion and Taros, Taurus, Canis Major, Monoceros, uh, Canis Minor, and are all associated here real close together. And so here's the area of the sky that that story is talking about. And as you move along, you know, move over here to Auriga, Cancer, Lynx, uh, Gemini, there's all sorts of other associations you can start creating. And it makes it easy to find Orion and Taurus are very easy to find. They're big, bright stars and they're the V of Taurus is very obvious, and Orion is just so obvious. It's, it's, uh, it's there. Monoceros, I have a harder time finding. Canis Major is easy because Cirrus is the brightest star in the sky, um, you know. And it's not some minor little constellations uh, that are uh, like up here, Canis Venatici, up here by uh, Ursa Major, becomes somewhat hard to find, um, you know, because it's basically two stars. So um, again, these can, this map that I'm looking at right here can be downloaded uh, from um, uh, skymaps.org, I believe it is, um, and it has lots of information on it. And so start talking about, you know, a, a sky map. Here's a maybe, uh, this is the only one I can find easily. Um, I don't have any other star atlases here. Uh, I need to bring my library down here, I guess. Uh, this is an image from uh, the Skies Up Global magazine, which is a production from the Explore Alliance, which is an a, uh, uh, Explore scientific program, but also gives you some larger sky associations as well. Um, you know, studying pages out of a star atlas, a sky atlas, you know, helps you see the constellations. And as I said, there were there's 88 constellations. I put an N on here to denote the ones that are in the Northern Celestial Hemisphere. Now then, we can see constellations here from Springdale, Arkansas that are south of the Celestial Sphere. I did not mark them. I didn't want to take the time to look them up and go through it all, but I knew which ones were in the nor Northern Hemisphere, Northern Celestial Hemisphere. Uh, so anyway, that's a quick overview of chapter three. As you, know, as you can see, these are real easy uh, you know, pro chapters, they're very well thought out, very well programmed. This helps you, you know, learn your way through the night sky. So again, there's the page for um, the uh, bit.ly link to the book and an observing club. Scott, you want me to, how about yeah. I, I'll write you want me, you want me e you're writing them down, you want me to email them to you? No, I'm doing it. Okay. Three L D, capital V, capital N, capital Y, capital A. There we go. Yeah, you know, I've been using Bitly for a long time, and when when Bitly started out, the, the links were only three or four, you know, characters long, and uh, now they're up to what uh, seven or eight or nine, you know. So even the Bitly links are starting to need Bitly links because they're getting so so long. So, but that's a whole lot easier than then writing out the long string. So did you get those, Scott? Got it, yes. Okay, so any questions out there, go ahead and feel free to ask them. I'm gonna shot, stop sharing my screen and there I am back again. Yep. Hey, so, and Chuck, just so you're aware too, uh, we will be using, you know, we have um, something called the mentor training program that we do here. And we're doing the same thing here in these programs, the educating uh, the general public, but we, we have to also educate our own staff, you know, mm -hmm. not everybody's into amateur astronomy that joins uh, a telescope manufacturing company. In fact, usually it's very few. Um, uh, I 
you know, uh, I can remember when uh, we were at, uh, even in telescope retail, um, it was literally just Mike West, who still um, actually just retired from OPT, but it was myself and Mike West that were the uh, people that were getting into amateur astronomy back in the 80s. And, you know, there was the thrill of Halley's Comet coming. And, uh, you know, it was uh, the growth in interest in astronomy was, was uh, amazing. And um, this little camera store I worked in just exploded in sales with telescopes. And, uh, and so we, um, we were close to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We were close to Palomar Observatory. We were close to Mount Wilson. And uh, it was wonderful because we got to meet astronomers, scientists, uh, amateur scientists. Uh, we started an astronomy club and all the rest of it. But um, uh, there were other people that worked at the store. You would have thought, gosh, you know, this is a telescope wonderland, okay? But uh, there were other people that worked at the store that uh, really just wanted to uh, get in at eight, leave at five, didn't want to think about a telescope when they got home, okay? Uh, this also, also happens in the telescope industry too. I'm pleased to say that we have a number of people here that are very much into it. And um, uh, so, and, and certainly Kent Martz is one of them. So Kent, thank you so much. Um, uh, Kent, also you used to, didn't you used to um, uh, be an editor of the Reflector? I had, I had to the Reflector, I think either three or four years uh, after, I can't remember who had done it. Uh, Bob was the president my last year or next to last year, sir. You're talking about Bob Jen? Yes, correct. Uh, so I think it was either three or four years that I did it in the time of my life. I had the time and then kids started getting older and you know how it goes and work changed. And then I had to step down. I really enjoyed doing it. Um, you know, and, and that was in the days when it was uh, astrophotography was not nearly as easy as it is today. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, now I'm sure they have a massive number of images to pick from, you know, for every issue because it's, it's so easy to, to, to create images compared to what it was back at, so many excellent. You know, in 1996, seven, eight, nine neighborhood. A lot's changed in you know, that period of time, whole lot. Oh yeah. So I've got, I had gray hair then too, but not nearly as much as I do now, but. <laughs> not because of the astrophotography, right? Not because of astrophotography. Oh. All right. You know, people yeah, I've, are- I've, I've got you as editor from 2003 through 2008. Oh, was that what it was? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Wow. And your predecessor, I think was Dick and Jen Winter. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Oh, right. That's right. And you're, they had done it. You're dutifully recorded in the list of key league figures that I've created for the league history, Ken. Well, I wouldn't be a key figure, but I appreciate being included with well, a lot of other our, great people. All of our editors are key people, believe me. <laughs> uh, it's, and, and, you know, uh, uh, what it seems like Jackie's brother was the one paginating this. He's still doing it? Chuck Bosher. No, not now, but he's the one who really got us to the current beautiful glossy cover that we have yeah yeah and, uh, so it's uh it was an enjoyable time so 2000 what was it three to eight three to eight mm -hmm. okay yeah so four or five years there interesting mm -hmm. you know and there's lots of volunteer opportunities at the league too chuck why don't you talk about some of those <laughs> <laughs> i i could use some help yes um the astronomical league has a huge number of committees that perform various functions uh, just these awards, for example, uh, require a great deal of work. We have to appoint judges. We have to have plaques prepared. We have to arrange transportation to uh, conventions and so forth. And so even though those are vice president duties, uh, I have to delegate a lot of that to other people uh, during the course of the year. We have bylaws committees. We have committees that are oriented around the library telescope program. Uh, we have uh, obviously our observe program division, which is enormous. We've given out over 16,000 certificates and pins to over 5,000 different people since these observe programs came into being in 1967. 
So yeah, it's a, an incredible program. It requires a lot of work. We have four national directors plus all of the coordinators of all of these programs. Uh, so there are all kinds of opportunities to get involved, uh, both at the regional level, uh, regional officers, and also at the national level. Uh, so it's just a matter of people letting us know that they're interested and available. And believe me, we can find things for people to do. And the email address is vice president at astroleague.org. That's correct. Yeah. No, and I'd like to say something along the lines of the universe sampler program, if I may, uh, Kent, if, if sure. you're jumping in. Uh, when I got started in astronomy at the age of seven, uh, I got started with a planisphere and a red light and a small pair of binoculars. And that's all you need. Uh, there's a young man in the state of Arkansas in the evening shade named Scott uh, Harrington uh, up in Northern Arkansas. And he got started at the age of 14 with a pair of seven by 35 binoculars. Those are small binoculars. And with those observed 250 deep sky objects, galaxies, clusters, and nebulae. Um, Eagle-eyed. Uh, he is. And he, by the way, has the cover story in the upcoming issue of Sky and Telescope. How, how old is he now? Uh, he's 27 now, I believe. Yeah, and so. uh, the, the story on the stellar nurseries on the cover of Sky and Telescope is his story uh, that he wrote for s &T. And he's done all this on his own, uh, living on a family farm in uh, northern Arkansas. And so with a small pair of binoculars, with a red light and a planisphere, uh, you can learn the sky and observe a tremendous number of things and get started. And I would recommend for anyone just absolutely beginning in astronomy, go buy the, the old nature, the golden nature guide stars. It's terribly out of date in that it's uh, planet locator stuff is like 1980s and it still regards Pluto as a planet. And there's some other things that are outdated in it, but it's the best first read in astronomy that I can recommend to anyone. Uh, is a great overview. And just those four things can get you started in this hobby. So I was looking up roughly where he lives. I'm going to share my screen again. This is one reason why he's able to do that with binoculars in this day and age. Yeah. It's, it's because of where he lives. And let me, but but it's not as great a sky as you think it would be. But uh, here we go. He lives right in here. Yeah. This neck of the woods right in here. So it's pretty dark. You know, but right up in here somewhere is going to be his house. You know, he's got some light pollution. You know, Batesville's not a big town. Uh, Jonesboro is decent sized. We're over here. But uh, he lives where he still has pretty good skies. And if you zoom out, you can see how unique he is compared to the eastern half of the United States. Yeah. You know, there's he lives in a place in the eastern part of the United States that's got great skies comparatively to nearly everybody else. So, but that's awesome that he's done that so recently. Um, you know, and uh, he's, he's published all of his stuff online, by the way. He's got a, all you have to do is type in 250 deep sky objects visible to the naked eye and seven by 35 binoculars. And you'll find the sum total of all of his research using seven by 35s or the naked eye in terms of what's visible, those 250 objects. So, uh, and he's also managed to observe two thirds of the Herschel 400 catalog with nothing larger than eight by 56 binoculars. So I can see Scott jumping too. I think he's looking <laughs> for that right now. I'm going to post the link. Yeah. If I, if I know Scott, like I think I know Scott, he'll have yeah. that up for everybody. You know, you know, there's a spot in um, cloudy nights. It's a topic that's from 2017, 2018 what? cloudy nights. What's his name? Scott Harrington. And what was it, 250? 250, the number 250 plus deep sky objects visible to the naked eye and seven by 35 binoculars. Let me see if I can find it as well. 10 minute astronomy. Uh, it usually comes up for me the minute I type 250 plus. Oh, maybe we'll have it up before yeah you've looked it up before i'm seeing a bunch of different ones i'm not sure 
Yeah, it's not it's not the cloudy night. Yeah. Okay. And the wonderfully useful site. Oh, I found it, Scott. It's a uh, it's on bridgeandastro.org.uk. Yeah, that, that I just found it too. It's a PDF file. Yep. Yeah, just go ahead and post that somewhere. I will post it. And then you can read. You, you want me to screen share it? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead and screen share it. We can go through it. I'll post it. Real okay. Quick. Hold, hold on. Let me, uh, let me, if I can share my screen, I will. Okay. Does, Scott, I shared it on Facebook. Will that go out to the, on the restream to everybody? It just goes out to Facebook. You put can, it on you, can you see that? Yes. Okay. Um, if you just type in 250 plus, this is the name of it right here. Right. And what follows this is, or, or this is Scott, and these are charts that he created. I see it now. Right yeah. here. It starts with galaxies. He's found able to see M81 was the faintest of the ones he could see naked eye. The rest were seven by 35s. Get more galaxies, more galaxies, bright nebulae and dark nebulae and big globular star clusters. I mean, it's an incredible amount of research that he did. And he's using a 10 inch SCT now to write, to study uh, H2 regions and galaxies, which is the subject of his sky and telescope article. So I'll just leave, I'll leave this title up right here. Is he going to school somewhere? Uh, he's working on the farm. With his, with his family. Oh, I guess it did show up on uh, YouTube. Yeah, so. He's a brilliant young man, very well educated, uh, homeschooled. So, uh, is he wanting to do anything in science or is he just doing this for himself? Because uh, he, he's doing this for himself. He's a consummate observer, just uh, highly skilled. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. I'll stop sharing. All right. Okay. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you for letting me jump in there, Ken. No, that's awesome. I mean, it, it just shows what you can do with just a little desire. You know, it, it, I'm sure it started with him looking up when he was four or five years old, like it did with me, you know, uh, and spending time with your parents, you know, Comet Bennett, Comet West. Uh, lunar eclipses, meteor showers. You know, my dad didn't buy a telescope from himself until he was 65. Um, and, uh, you know, he just was a, a naked eye guy and doing a little bit of astrophotography. And, you know, in backyard of Clarksville, Arkansas in the 60s was, uh, was, was spectacular. And because of light pollution, and even when we moved to Springdale in the 70s, and I've talked about this before, I took a roll of uh, Triax film and uh, uh, with a Minolta, I need to find this picture, I'd love to find it. With my dad's Minolta 102, locked the shutter open in middle of December and let it run for 11 hours, I think it was, 11 or 12 hours. And um, then processed it the next morning mm -hmm. and got a spectacular all night sky tra or star trail. And I was able to do that from what is now in the deep, deep, deep downtown Springdale. And Scott, <laughs> that wouldn't happen anymore. I know. <laughs> you know, that's for sure. You know, it was it was no reciprocity failure. I was overjoyed to be probably yeah. 13 years old and do that. Sure. Um, but I don't know where that image is. And I'd love to find the negative, but who knows where that thing is now. So anyway, but uh, it just takes a little spark of inspiration. He got his from Jack Orkheimer. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Who knows how many people Jack influenced, you yeah. know, I'm sure, you know. Well, all, all of the people that do educational outreach, uh, we never know, you know, I've, I've done some myself and you just never know where it's going to, where it's going to lead. But I think that, you know, if you're in it for a while, and you see kids grow up or you see other people that uh, even adults that uh, you might have shown the stars to or Saturn for the first time or whatever, 
I think it just makes our lives a little bit better. You know, I think it does. So. Uh, we got to talk about light pollution. You know, okay. I said, I said, okay. Scott gets tired of me. He's never told me don't do it, but, do it. but we have got to deal with light pollution as a country. It's not a, it's not a city problem. It's not a county problem. It's what? not a region problem. It's not a state problem. It is a national problem. And it's only really going to get addressed on a national basis. Um, you know, and it's, and our efforts are not for, for us. It's not for my kids. It's not for my grandkids. It's maybe for my great, great grandkids. You know, we're talking about a hundred years from now. <clears throat> it took this to get this way 50 years and really more like a hundred, but it's going to take 50 or hundred years to, to, to deal with it. But it starts with us. The people are watching this and the people are going to see this on YouTube you know, International Dark Sky Association, Google it, start educating yourself, talk to people about it. It takes time, but you never know when that one person you're going to talk to is a person that can make a difference and cause a change, at least in the city where you live. Sure. So light pollution. I think light pollution actually is responsible for the disappearance of junior astronomy societies that abounded in the country in the 1950s. Mm, uh, in the 1950s, we had, uh, it was the space age, the atomic age, we had Bell telephone science specials on TV that the whole family watched. There was tremendous interest in science, especially with the space race going on. But then things changed. Uh, now, young people can't observe in their backyards if they live anywhere close to a city at all. Mm -hmm. I did, I, I was able to observe the entire Messier catalog from my backyard and I'm about seven miles from downtown Louisville. Oh, no. uh, now it looks like a white ceiling mm -hmm. you know, over my head. Uh, so in order for me to observe, I, I do all my all-nighters at Patoka Lake, I drive 72 miles one way. Well, parents aren't gonna have their kids 72 miles away they're not, going to all them, they're not going to have them up there with people they don't know. And, you know, it just creates a huge problem for young people to get involved. It's hard to get excited about observing something you can't see. <laughs> exactly. You know, and, 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 and as Scott and I have discussed before, astrophotography, narrowband filters are where this hobby's going yeah. because, you know, there's, you know, Chuck IU blues in downtown Detroit. Um, I've got a customer that lives in the Bronx, you know, and he does really good imaging from his backyard or from from his apartment complex courtyard. Um, one of the light, most light polluted places on earth and narrow bend filters. He can't see it, but through the alchemy of plate solving, which is, you know, that's Beelzebubian. I mean, that's dark magic right there, you know, doing plate solving to, to find, to point at stuff you can't see, uh, spectacular technology that opens up the sky for people who do that. But it's hard for kids to get into that because you got to have, you know, an Exos 100 with go to capability. You know, you got to have a couple thousand dollars to be able to do that potentially. If you already own a camera and get our IXOS 100 for, you know, 500 bucks. You can get into it pretty easy and do some of that stuff. And that's what we're trying to push and talk about. But um, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a hard challenge for kids to do that kind of stuff because of the money input. Whereas you and I, a pair of surplus World War II binoculars or Korean War binoculars in my case, um, that, was, that was it, you know, yeah. I mean, and you could see everything. You, I can remember the night sky just being just glorious and it's, it's gone, but it's still there. It's hiding in plain sight. So a um, comment um, that in, uh, in the UK that they're talking about uh, uh, increasing the light situation uh, because of crimes against women. Uh, but I think that um, there's been a lot of studies shown that uh, you give criminals, crazy criminal people more light, it just makes it easier for them to find their victims or things they'd like to damage or steal, you know? So 
And it, it uh, creates more stark shadows, dark shadows. Places, places. places to hide. Yeah. True. That's very yeah. true. Makes it easier for them if they're going to hide, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, somebody, I don't know who it was. Um, uh, I, oh, Bruce McMath, uh, Arkansas Natural Sky Association guy. And yeah. it's, it's probably not original to Bruce, but um, his point is, if, if light were an antiseptic for crime, then there would be no crime in the daytime. <laughs> you know, which, you know, but there's crime in the daytime when there's plenty of light. Light doesn't stop anything, you know. Um, it's a, if you're going to put lights in your backyard to drive off criminals, put a motion detector on it. You want to see some criminals skedaddle when a motion detector goes off and all your lights on in your backyard go off and light up. The, now, that's going to make criminals leave, leave the neighborhood. It's also going to make you wake up because those lights came on potentially. But I've asked people, you're, you, you have lights on so you can see criminals out in your backyard, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you stay up all night looking for them? Well, well No then why do you leave your lights on all night long? And not ever a particularly good answer for that. No. So, no. But well, a, lot it, of it, a lot of it is just people com competing yeah. for advertising. My sign's mm -hmm. got to be brighter than the next businesses so that's people see it. That's the big problem. There's a town in Washington called Steelacum. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's between Seattle and Tacoma and on the coast of Puget Sound, and they just banned all the on signs. And so everybody, every business in this town has a wooden sign. And it's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it, it's quaint, it's beautiful. People love going there. Uh, people find the businesses just as easily as before. And uh, I think even businesses like McDonald's had to go to some sort of non-eliminated sign there so it, it can be done well i've seen conv convenience stores and car lots around here used to be the biggest offender especially new car lots and i have seen newer construction um not having terrible lights you know all their lights in the, in the convenience stores are now recessed up in the awning over the gas pumps there's light on the ground but there's no light going out uh, same with some new car lots that have gone in. You know, I think there's some lighting engineers that are uh, aware of this and are designing it in. And whether they're telling the people or not, you know, is irrelevant because if they're satisfied with the light, then no need to say, well, we're going to put up dark sky friendly lights because that makes people automatically go, what? No, we, we, we need light. And the misconception of what that means um, but then you see a, a, a new building go in that's got terrible lights. And so either you rely on peer pressure to do it or you establish a national lighting code, just act like we have a national plumbing code and a national fire code and a national building code. There's codes for this stuff. And, and I think ultimately that has to be the route we go to, to really, really attack this in any kind of a sort of direct fashion other than piecemeal. Like here where in Benton County, where I live, there's 27 municipalities, two municipal electrics, and three, uh, four rural electrics. So if I had to work with each one of those how long would that take and how many meetings would one person have to go to, to try and affect the change on a countywide basis, you know, to get each one of those entities to adopt some measure of, of dark sky stuff. And, and then you got to go to the next County and then to the next County. And, and it's, it's, it's an overwhelming task at the local level. So. There's a little town in Colorado called West Cliff. Have you heard of that Kent? No, I haven't. Yeah, it's, it lies in one of those big wide valleys between parallel mountain ranges mm -hmm. west of Pueblo. And they decided to cut down on lights, to put everything in full cutoff or to minimize lights at night. And they started drawing amateur astronomers there. And all of a sudden their, their bread and breakfasts, their hotels, their restaurants were booming with amateur astronomers. 
who cause no trouble at all. They're quiet, they sleep all day, they're observing at night. Uh, some of the ranchers didn't want to go away from security lighting, but they got on board too. And now they're leasing out space for the amateur astronomers on their, on their ranches to observe. And it's become a mecca for, for, yeah. for amateur astronomers uh, we, just because of those changes. We talked about this. There, there's a dark sky park in Arkansas, the Buffalo National River. Mm -hmm. And there is a city. It's the smallest city in Arkansas and one of the smallest cities in the country, the town of Gilbert which has a population of 26 or 28. And there are 16 streetlights in this town that no one asked to be put up, but the electric provider just put them up. And now they can't, over, the, over time, this has been going on for a long time, and now the energy provider will not take them down and refuses to. And, you know, Gilbert is working hard to try and, you know, get control of those lights. So frankly, they can turn them all out and have a, dark because they they want to be that and it's you know it, it's it's a challenge you know and it it's they just won't budge i think it's probably because they fear if they give that city the ability to, to deal with the lights it's the camel's nose under the tent and you know fighting a very large multi-state energy company is well, they, they don't ask people. I mean, if they put in electricity to a farm, they put up a security light. Yeah. You know why? I, I read why back. I was reading because back when rural electric was coming in, they wanted, they, the people putting in rural, rural electric, it was a marketing strategy to say, and it was bragging, I have electricity on my farm because <laughs> the security light was advertising to everybody else. And so if you want to be modern and big time, you put up a, a security light, which cast half of its light up in the sky and creates harsh shadows. And, you know, while it has some effect, it, it, it doesn't have, I know plenty of farms around here that get broken into and they have security lights, you know, yeah. you know locks keep the honest people out. <laughs> so security lights keep, the more or less honest or scaredy cat criminals out, but the ones who want to break into your house and take your stuff, they're going to break out and take your stuff one way or the other. And if they have a BB gun, they have an automatic off switch for the light anyway, so they can deal with it that way. So here we go. I'll post this right here. This is uh, an abstract by Jennifer Do Dolik and Nicholas Sanders. And it says, under the cover of darkness, how ambient light influences criminal activity. So uh, there's, there's a whole study on it right there. Um, but um, Mike Wiesner points out it's an IDA dark sky city or community. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah, probably not much crime there. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, when was the last time, the, you know, when my days at the Winter Star Party, the, the most rowdy thing that happened was on the closing night, every night, Friday night, I think it was Friday night or Saturday night, someone would always set off some fireworks. And I can remember hearing people talk about just, they wanted, they, they, they're having people out trying to catch them doing it. And it was sort of like the MIT Rutgers prank, you know, however, you know, it was like, it was like a challenge to whoever was doing it. I don't know. It'd been going on for five or 10 years at the time. And, uh, it was uh, quite the uh, uh, fun when about four o'clock in the morning, pew, 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 fireworks started going off and somehow they remotely triggered it. Pretty cool. But that's about the rowdiest I've ever seen in a star party. I mean, it's been, they're not criminals. We're not criminals. That's true. That's true. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with... Um, uh, open go to community uh, program and uh, with uh, Jerry Hubble and give you an update on the uh, Ast Explore Scientific Astrophotography Contest that's going on here. I look forward, uh, Chuck, to um, engaging with the Astronomical League's uh, uh, Astrophotography Contest. I think it's going to be real exciting and uh, uh, all you great astrophotographers out there need to uh, brush off your files and uh, present your best uh, because it's going to be uh, it's going to be great and it'll be great recognition. Are there prizes involved? I, I'm sure that we will offer prizes. Absolutely. Ooh. Yeah. 
Ooh. Ooh, that's right. So anyhow, um, great show. Thank you very much. And looks like our, our uh, rain is over for a little while at least. Maybe we have more tonight. But uh, you guys be safe out there. And uh, as Jack Horkheimer always said, keep looking up. Take care. Hey, Scott, there's no sound. Hello, everybody. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific. <laughs> and today I'm going to talk about the world famous Galileo telescope kit. This is the kit that you assemble by yourself. You'll learn how optics work by assembling the objective lens uh, and also the eyepiece. And there's two different eyepieces that are in this. It's a 25 power, 20 millimeter eyepiece. But it also comes with this very clever little device here that works both as a Barlow lens that will double the magnification of this eyepiece, making it 50 power, or it can be used also as a Galilean eyepiece, which gives 17 power to the telescope. This is what Galileo virtually saw through his own telescope. So you can have that same experience that Gal Galileo had looking at the moon, uh, looking at Saturn's rings, looking at Jupiter. Uh, it is a telescope that was designed for the International Year of Astronomy in 2009. And uh, it's a fantastic kit, both for child and adult, uh, to learn how a telescope works. And so if you get the telescope like this, you can either have it on a stand like this, you can hand hold it like a pirate's glass, or on the bottom here, we have Iron matey. our thread here that you can put it on a camera tripod. Very versatile, very rugged, and a lot of fun, all from Explore Scientific. Thank you.